Psalm 144, a psalm of David. Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. My goodness and my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him? Or the son of man that thou makest the count of him? Man is like to vanity. His days are as a shadow that passeth away. Bow thy heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains, and they shall smoke. Cast forth lightning, and scatter them. Shoot out thine arrows, and destroy them. Send thine hand from above. Rid me, and deliver me out of great waters from the hand of strange children, whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. I will sing a new song unto thee, O God. Upon a psaltery and an instrument of ten strings will I sing praises unto thee. It is he that giveth salvation unto kings, who delivereth David his servant from the hurtful sword. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children, whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace, that our garners may be full according to all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets, that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in nor going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Psalm 144, another one that just rang true for me this week as I read it over, and then even more so after I studied it out a bit. The interesting thing about these psalms is they are songs. And so sometimes you'll read them and there'll be a meter to them. You'll hear a rhythm in the words. But they didn't write songs like we write songs, and so often it doesn't play out that way. But even still, sometimes we expect to see it play out as a narrative and in a certain order, and it doesn't do that either, because in a song, typically, there will be the verse and then, and then a, a chorus of sorts, and then it'll go back to another verse, and there'll be a bridge, how we think of it. But again, they don't write psalms that way, and they didn't write psalms that way. There's no notes in here, and so I can't, I can't say one way or another. And I, there definitely wouldn't be any recordings of this psalm back from the time of David. But nevertheless, these are fantastic words for truth, fantastic words for, for, for building doctrines, for, for supporting doctrines. Some people use the psalms, and I have as well, as like a, as like a dictionary of sorts, or, 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 or a, what would it be, like an index. You can go there and find out what God thinks about a certain topic, blessedness, perhaps, hearing, prayer, and you could go and you could just read through the Psalms and these little portions of scriptures which would show you the big picture of biblically what that topic is all about. The first verse there, I believe, gives us right away what we're talking about is that blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the Lord. Now this is both a statement of fact and obviously a, a charge for us as well. Also a charge for us. Blessed be the Lord. He is blessed, of course. But as David said, we ought to think to ourselves also that I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. How do we bless God? One way is to praise Him. Another way is to bow and to kneel before Him. We can bless the Lord by being obedient to His word. Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the Lord. He is blessed, of course, but we also ought to seek to bless Him. I will bless Him. I will bless the Lord at all times. I will sing praises unto the Lord. I will, I will continually have His praise in my mouth. Blessed be the Lord. I want to bless my Lord. I want Him to be blessed by me. He is certainly blessed. Is He blessed by me? Is He blessed by you today, yesterday, this week? Did you bless God? He deserves to be certainly blessed. He, he is worthy of receiving a blessing, I would think. I think He created us so that we would bless Him. He wants us to, to, to walk before Him in a certain way. 
which would bring warmth and joy to his heart. He would, he would feel the praise of his creation singing and shouting up to him, and that would bring great blessing to God. He would rejoice in that. God is blessed. Is he blessed by you? He deserves to be. He's worthy. It says, Blessed be the Lord, my strength. God's your strength, it means he's your rock. To the world, he's a rock of offense and stumbling. He doesn't bring them strength. But he's my strength. Blessed be the Lord, my strength. To me, he's the foundation. To me, he's my support. He's my surety. That's what I lean on. Of course, they make us go and get insurance plans for our vehicle, but our surety, our assurance, our insurance is in God and the fact that He's our rock, He's our strength. Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. He teaches my hands and my fingers to war and to fight. What do we do with our hands? Sometimes we can be busy about things that don't matter much, but ultimately if we let these things be led by God and taught of God of what to do, these things can work, they can build, they can accomplish, they can labor, they can succeed, they can do great things as God teaches them and leads them. Fighting doesn't just need to be, you know, with fists and violence. War doesn't need to be just with with the same. But God can use our members our hands and our fingers to fight spiritual battles our hands to war spiritually the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through god to the pulling down of strongholds of course but it can also be just brute strength especially in a man that's leading especially in one like david who's who's both a king and a warrior he says of god he taught my fingers he teaches my hands to war he teaches my fingers to fight to war, to work, to build, to accomplish, and to succeed. He says, my goodness, in verse 2. Blessed be the Lord, my goodness. He, he provides me kindness. That's what it means, goodness. It's mercy, it's favor. It's the same words that's being used here. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. His kindness ought to lead you and draw you into repentance. His kindness ought to, and, and His mercy and His favor that He shows towards you in that great long-suffering God, ought to, ought to, when you think about Him, when you, when you meditate upon Him, you got to go, man, He is just so good to me despite all I have done against Him, perhaps. He's so kind. He's so merciful. He shows me favor. I don't deserve such a thing. He is my fortress. That's a sanctuary. That's a hiding place. That's a refuge. When you're in the fortress, who cares about what's outside? Let them fight. Let them, let them yell. Let them holler. Let them, let them attack. When you're in the sanctuary, when you're in that hiding place, when you're in the fortress, when God is your fortress, you're inside. You're with Him. You're safe. There's nothing to concern yourself with with respect to what's on the outside. Blessed be the God, my fortress. Blessed be the Lord, my high tower. God is your high tower. It speaks to the vision that He gives you. The foresight, right? The advantage that comes from being well up, well high. You can see far and distant into the land. That's wisdom. When you know something is on the horizon and coming your way, you can respond accordingly. If you're in a fortress with a high tower, it's even better. You'll see the enemy come long before they even get to the outer threshold of your defense. God is your fortress. God is your high tower. You have sanctuary and you have vision and foresight. You'll know what's coming and you'll know how to respond and you'll be safe inside. Blessed be the Lord, my deliverer. That's your escape. That's your carrying away to safety. When you're delivered, you're caught up and brought away from whatever was challenging you, whatever was fighting after you. You're delivered. You've been delivered. It's like when you fall into the water and you don't have a life jacket, you're struggling and somebody comes and grabs you and pulls you out of the water. You've been delivered from the danger, the temptation. Blessed be the Lord, my deliverer. He's these things to you. He's your strength. He teaches your hands and your fingers to war, to fight. He's your goodness. He's your fortress. He's your high tower. He's your deliverer. He's your shield. Blessed be the Lord, my shield. That's protection. That's defense. 
We talked about the hedge of protection that's round about you. That's your shield, spiritually speaking. God will defend his own. God will protect his own. You simply lift him up and he provides a shelter, a shield. Even when you're outside of the fortress, even when you're not standing on the high tower, when you're out and about, you still have that shield and that protection and that defense given by God. He says in verse 2 at the end there, and he in whom I trust. And again, as much as he is blessed and deserves to be blessed, he is trustworthy and deserves to be trusted. David here says, the Lord is my strength. He teaches my hands to war. He's my goodness, my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, my shield. I trust in him. And he's worthy of it. Who subdueth my people under me. Subdueth my people under me. What David here is saying is that people only follow him because God has brought them to follow him. David here is admitting that his only power is that which God provides through his providence and his care. David is a mighty man. David is a king. But look at it. In all of these words, David is acknowledging that the blessing is only there because of God and he's only who he is having people even following him because God has been all of these things to him. David says, you know what? I'd have nobody following me. You know what? He couldn't even lead about my own house. You know what? I'd just be out there on my own were it not for God who is all of these things. My strength, my goodness, my fortress, my tower, my deliverer, my shield. He's everything to me. I trust in him. In verse 3 it says, Lord, what is man? And I think David, where he, before he makes a statement like this, it's, it's not because he's looking at all of these people out there and being like, ugh, what, what is man? What are these? What are those? And, and turning his nose up at them. No, he, he's, he's reflecting inwardly because he just said, look, I'm nothing without God. But blessed be the Lord. Oh, that I could bless him. The only reason that I could and the only way I could bless him was because he's done all of these things and, be, and been all of these things to me. He said, Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him? Or the son of man that thou makest the count of him. Man is like to vanity. His days are as a shadow that passeth away. Man is like nothing. Man is like vain, vanity. Just, just space. Just empty. Just useless. Just pointless. Like a shadow that passeth away. Man is vanity but only something. Man is empty but only has substance. Because God acknowledges him and God accounts for him. What is man, Lord, that you would take knowledge of him? What is the son of man that thou would account for him? He's, he's acknowledging and calling out to God and saying, you know what, God? We are vain, but for the knowledge that you take of us. Lord, we are a shadow, but that you've accounted for us. You've taken note. I like that verse there. I thought about it a little bit. It says, his days are as a shadow that passeth away. How does a shadow pass away? Well, essentially, once the sun is at his height, the shadow disappears out of our sight. In other words, the more exalted the sun, the sun of righteousness, the, the, the sun of man, right, the light of the world, the more that he is exalted, God is exalted, the higher he sits in our world, the smaller our shadow is. And the shorter our days are, and the more vain we should, ought, we should appear in our own sight. Man is vanity. His shadow, his days just pass away as God is exalted. But what a blessing that that exalted, mighty, blessed God would take account of me. That he would acknowledge and recognize and see and, and see any value in me. I believe that the only reason he could is that he has been my strength. He has taught me to war. He has been my goodness. He has been my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, my shield. I trust in him. Without him, I can do nothing. Anyone following me, it's but by him subduing them, him leading them to do so. 
Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him, or the son of man that thou makest account of him? Verse 5, it says, Bow thy heavens, O Lord. Bow your heavens and come down. David pleads to God. He says, God, humble yourself to condescend to me. Bow yourself down and bring your heavens down. Bless us, God, that we might bless you. And look again, if we're looking at God as all of these things to us, and Christ certainly is all these things to us, did he not, if he did not honor and answer David's prayer there, there wouldn't have been a way made that we could be all those things. What I mean? Well, Jesus had to come down. He had to humble heavens and bring down, down to us here on earth in order that we could receive him and have him as all of these characters of his great compassion in our life. Jesus Christ is my strength. The heavens were bowed and he came down to be that for me. Jesus Christ is my strength, my goodness, my fortress, my high tower, because he bowed the heavens, he humbled himself and came down, condescended to us of such low estate, taking knowledge of me, taking account of me, though I was vanity and nothing. God came down and provided himself that he could be my shield, that I could trust in him. Verse 5, bow thy heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains, and they shall smoke. Cast forth lightning and scatter them. Shoot out thine arrows, destroy them. Send thine hand from above. Rid me and deliver me out of great waters from the hand of strange children. I see all of these physical things that belong to nature and the earth. Lightning and mountains and, and, and smoke coming from them and, and, and God ridding me of great waters. <laughs> and then he says this, and from the hand of strange children. Strange children, I think there's a little bit of prophetic language going on here. He says, God, come down, touch the mountains, and they shall smoke. And didn't he do that in the time of Exodus? He came down and met with Moses, and those mountains were as a as a flame of fire, as he met with him there. <clears throat> Through the course of time, Jesus came down and stood on these mountains. And they smoke, and they burn, and they suffer loss as a result of Christ being here. Mountains, prophetically, are, are cities, are empires, are kingdoms of men. You can read about those different types as you, as you go through Revelation, perhaps. In other places. He talks also about the waters. He said, deliver me out of great waters. And I believe we've talked about that briefly when we, when we mentioned the, uh, the disciples entering into the ship and they were tossed about of great waters. That's the world. That's fallen man. That's, that, that's, that's the world wrestling against men and, and, and being tempestuous whenever some wing, wind of doctrine falls upon them. And so when he says, from the hand of strange children, I believe he's just connecting all of those ideas. He, he used parables or symbols of great waters and of, of mountains as an illustration to talk about this strange child, these strange children. The world, the fallen men, those men that make up the cities, the empires, the kingdoms of men. He says, God, come down here and deal with these. Deal with this world. Deal with this world kingdom that's under the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Take care of the mountains. Set them aflame. Control the waters, speaking them to peace. Be still. And really, not just these strange children, but as I said before, us as men, our vanity, days like shadows that passeth away. Nothing unless God takes account of us. And that's ultimately the difference between me as one of his child and them as a strange child. Strange children. Waters I need to be delivered from and need to be have rid from me. Mountains. 
O God, come and make them smoke. Remove their influence from me. Verse 8, it says, Whose mouth speaketh vanity. Talking about the strange children. Their mouth speaketh vanity. Their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. Their mouth is empty, vain. Their strength then is in error. When we live in a world that is strengthened, amongst people that are strengthened by error. How often do you hear people take great, great solace and great comfort in a lie? In their right hand, the strength that they have is just a right hand of falsehood. My strength is errors. That's the world at large. People want to trust in a lie of this religion. They want to trust in the lie of this government official. They want to trust in the lie of... You, you name it. <laughs> Verse 9, I will sing a new song. Remember he's saying, blessed be the, the God. Blessed be the Lord, my, my strength. He talks about the world a little bit and, and brings them to remembrance and says, God, come down. Humble thyself. Come here. Deal with this. Rid me of these strange children, this great water, these mountains I dwell in and upon. I will sing a new song, verse 9. I will sing unto thee, O God. Upon a psaltery and an instrument of ten strings will I sing praises unto thee. Blessed be the Lord. Sing unto him. When we Praise God, we bless God. This is what David's saying. You know what? I'm going to sing a song unto thee. I want you to be blessed. I'm going to, I'm going to bring up a psaltery. I'm going to grab my instrument of ten strings and you will hear praises. You will be blessed from my mouth. Verse 10, it says, It is he that giveth salvation unto kings, who delivereth David his servant from the hurtful sword. David finds deliverance from God. He finds deliverance and safety from the attacks of this world and the worldly. And he begins to praise God. Again, the chorus, verse 11, Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children, whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is the right hand of falsehood. Our right hand is the right hand of God where Christ sitteth. Verse 12, and he begins to talk about these, these great characteristics of a, of a, of a different kingdom. <laughs> Bow the heavens, God, come down. Touch the mountains, he said in verse 5. He talks about his lightning scattering the world, his arrows destroying the world, his hand ridding his people from the great waters and the strange children and all the vanity that they offer and the strength that they find in their own lies. David says, you know what? I'll praise thee, God. You give great salvation to kings. You even deliver David from the hurtful sword. Verse 12, it says, that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth. He says, God, would you give me fruitfulness in my house? That our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of the palace. I want my sons to be grown, to be wise, to be strong even in their youth, to be mature even when they're but children, a little bit older. I want my daughters to be beautiful. I want them to be Strong as well as the foundations of a palace, but purified as they're polished. Suitable to hold up a whole palace. Verse 13, that our garners may be full. It's a storehouse. Offering all manner of store that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets. He says, not only do God would you allow for us to have a full storehouse, but also offering all manner. We want all manner of store. Full and with variety. You know, it's great to have a full storehouse of wheat, but you'll get tired of wheat pretty quick, won't we? But David cries out to God and he says, God, bless us. Continue to bless us that we could have a variety of food in our storehouses that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in the streets. Fruitfulness in our sons, fruitfulness in our daughters, fruitfulness to bring in a variety into the storehouse, fruitfulness in sheep, 
Be plentiful in provision to us, O God, verse 14, that our oxen may be strong to labor. And no, So not only are we going to bring in lots, but we're going to have the assistance of these beasts of the field to make the labor not so tiresome and to make it easier on us because our oxen are strong to labor. The next prayer that, God wa- that David wants from God is that, that there would be no breaking in nor going out. Peace from our enemies. That there would be no complaining in our streets. Peace from our own. (laughs) God, we don't want to have to go out and fight. We don't want our enemy coming and breaking in. We don't want peace to be removed from us because we're complaining and murmuring against you. Look at all of these things, God. Would you provide them? And God's saying, yeah, he will. Blessed be the Lord. And he does so. He provides for us all of those things on that, uh, that would apply to that righteous nation by blessing his individuals by being these things to them. Strength, teaching, goodness, fortress, high tower, deliverer, shield. He in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. And the Bible actually is indicating here he subdueth people that are against David as well. I love this in verse 15. He says, Happy is the people that is in such a case. What is that case? Well, people that bless God and are blessed of God. People that have God as their trust. People that know they're vain, but are humbled by the fact that the God of the universe would bow himself, come down, taking knowledge of them, taking account of them, would be to them a God as they are to him a people. Happy is the people that is in such a case that would sing praises to him, singing new songs unto God upon the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings, doing the best we can with the talents that we've been given. Happy is the people that is in such a case. Yea, happy are the people whose God is the Lord. The happiest people understand that they have sufficient enough. They're content with such things as they have. The happiest people are the ones that have the blessings of sons, have the blessings of daughters, have the blessings of storehouses, have have sheep enough, and have oxen to assist in their labor that aren't in war from without, aren't going out to war and making it themselves, and there's no complaining within their circle, within their house. Those people are happy for all those things that they have. They know they have enough because they know that they have the Lord. Happy is the people in such a case. Yea, happy is the people whose God is the Lord. Ultimately, bottom line is, that's that's what has to make us happy. The fact that God is the Lord. The fact that He is our God. And all of these different things in this psalm, David's just reminiscing about what God has been to him. How God has come down to him, defended him, fought for him, rid him of the strange children that are fighting against him in order to provide him this sanctuary to live in. These are simple needs, and and the thing that is, is, is occurring to me is that we may be entering into times where we have to really just love and enjoy and relish and be happy in what's simple. People are still going to be chasing after money, still going to be chasing after things, chasing after wealth, chasing after this and that. Let the strange children continue to do that. You know what? God, rid me of that. Deliver me from that and let me be satisfied and happy with having sons that are grown, that are wise, that are strong in their youth. Lord, let me be happy with having a daughter having daughters that that are beautiful and strong and and ornaments of grace in your eyes give me storehouse with some variety give me sheep plentiful in provision of of meat and clothing give me oxen to help me with my labors give me strength to complete the labors sweating off my brow but not too hard lord Give me peace for my enemies that I don't need to go to battle or have battle come to my gates. Lord, don't let me complain. 
Don't let the people around me complain. Happy is the people in such a case. It's so simple. <laughs> There's no Ferraris in there. There's no big pickup trucks in there. There's no big houses in there. They're simply having family, having food with variety. What a blessing. Having, having sheep, having oxen help you with the labor, having support with the labor, not in battle, not complaining. That's happiness there. If that's not happiness to you, well, <laughs> let's look to a psalm like this and just redefine happiness. Ask God to redefine happiness. Ask God, ask God to allow for you to be content with such things as ye have. And ultimately, the most important thing that you can have is God. Happy is the people whose God is the Lord and happy is the people that dwell in such a case. So yes, at the end of the psalm, you see all of these great things that are simple, but bring happiness. And at the beginning of this psalm, you find the most important of all is that you have the Lord. He is your strength. He is your teacher. He is your goodness, your fortress, your tower. He is your deliverer. He is your shield. And it is He upon whom you can trust. What a blessing that God would take knowledge of you. What a blessing that He would take account of you. And you're really nothing. You're vain. So above vanity, above a disappearing shadow, look at all that you can have. If you understand that to be content with the simple things that this world has to offer and ask God to rid you of the things that are vain themselves, you can be happy, you can be content, you can be overjoyed having two things. Simplest life and God Almighty God. I think David is just overwhelmed in reflecting upon this. Blessed be the Lord. Oh, that I could bless him. He's blessed me. And I'm thankful for it.